Welcome to Madison Public Library in Madison, Ohio's Theater of the Mind, Halloween edition. Tonight, we conclude The Fall of the House of Usher by Edgar Allan Poe. To hear more stories, like this video, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Last night, we left off with the narrator describing having just left where the body was laid. And now, we return to the final part of The Fall of the House of Usher, by Edgar Allan Poe. And now, some days of bitter grieving having elapsed, an observable change came over the features of the mental disorder of my friend. His ordinary manner had vanished. His ordinary occupations were neglected or forgotten. He roamed from chamber to chamber with hurried, unequal, and objectiveless steps. The parlor of his countenance had assumed, if possible, a more ghastly hue but the luminescence of his eye had utterly gone out. The once occasional huskiness of his tone was heard no more, and a tremulous quaver, as if of extreme terror, habitually characterized his utterance. There were times, indeed, when I thought his unceasingly agitated mind was laboring with some oppressive secret to divulge which he struggled for the necessary courage, at times, again, I was obliged to resolve all into the mere inexplicable vagrancies of madness, for I beheld him gazing upon vacancies for long hours, in an attitude of the profoundest attention, as if listening to some imaginary sound. It was no wonder that his condition terrified, that it infected me. I felt creeping upon me. <clears throat> by slow yet certain degrees, the wild influences of his own fantastic yet impressive superstitions. It was, especially, upon retiring to bed late in the night of the seventh or eighth day after the placing of the Lady Madeline within the dungeon, that I experienced the full power of such feelings. Sleep came not near my couch. While the hours waned and waned away, I struggled to reason off the nervousness which had dominion over me. I endeavored to believe that much, if not all of what I had felt, was due to the bewildering influence of the gloomy furniture of the room, of the dark and tattered draperies, which, tortured into motion by the breath of the rising tempest, swaying fitfully to and fro upon the walls, and rustled uneasily about the decorations of the bed. But my efforts were fruitless, and irreparable pressable tremor gradually pervaded my frame, and at length there set upon my very heart an incubus of utterly causeless alarm. Shaking the sauce off with a gasp and a struggle, I uplifted myself upon the pillows, and, peering earnestly within the intense darkness of the chamber, hearkened, I know not why, except that an instinctive spirit prompted me to certain low and indefinite sounds which came through the pauses of the storm at long intervals. I know not whence, overpowered by the intense sentiment of horror, unaccountable yet undurable, I threw on my clothes with haste, for I felt that I should sleep no more during the night, and in endeavor to arouse myself from the pitiable condition into which I had fallen by pacing rapidly to and th fro throughout the apartment. I had taken but a few turns in this manner when a light step on the adjoining staircase arrested my attention. I presently recognized it as that of Usher, and an instant afterward he rapped with a gentle touch at my door and entered, bearing a lamp. His countenance was, as usual, cadaverously wan, but moreover there was a species of mad hilarity in his eyes, a evident restraint hysteria in his whole demeanor. His air appalled me, but anything was preferable to the solitude which I had long endured, and I even welcomed his presence as a relief. And you have not seen it, he said abruptly, having stared about him for some moments in silence. You have not seen it then? But stay, you shall, thus speaking, and having carefully shaded his lamp, he hurried to one of the casements and threw it freely open to the storm. The impetus fury of the entering gust nearly lifted us from our feet. It was, indeed, a tempest, yet sternly beautiful night. 
and one wildly singular in its terror and its beauty. A whirlwind had apparently collected its force in our vicinity, for there were frequent and violent alterations in the direction of the wind, and this exceeding density of the clouds, which hung so low as to press upon the turrets of the house, did not prevent our perceiving the lifelike velocity with which they flew careering from all points against each other, without passing away into the distance. I say that even their exceeding density did not prevent our perceiving this, yet we had no glimpse of the moon or stars, nor was there any flashing forth of the lightning. But the under surface of the huge masses of agitated vapor, as well as all terrestrial objects immediately around us, were glowing in the unnatural light of a faintly luminous and distinctly visible gaseous exhalation which hung about and enshrouded the mansion. You must not, you shall not behold this, said I, shudderingly to Usher, as I led him with a gentle violence from the window to a seat. These appearances which bewilder you are merely electrical phenomena, not uncommon. Or it may be that they have their ghastly origin in the rank miasma of the tarn. Let us close this casement. The air is chilling and dangerous to your frame. Here is one of your favorite romances. I will read it, and you shall listen, and so we shall pass away this terrible night together. The antique volume which I had taken up was The Mad Trist of Sir Lancelot Canning, but I had called it a favorite of Usher's more in sad jest than in earnest, for, in truth, there is little in this uncouth and unimaginative prolixity which could have interest for the lofty and spiritual ideality of my friend. It was, however, the only book immediately at hand, and I indulged a vague hope that the excitement which now agitated the hypochondriac might find relief, for the history of mental disorder is full of similar anomalies, even in the extremeness of the folly which I should read. Could I have judged, indeed, by the wild, overstrained air of vivacity with which he hearkened, or apparently hearkened, to the words of the tale, I might well have congratulated myself upon the success of my design. I had arrived at the well-known portion of the story while Ethered, the hero of the tryst, having sought in vain a perceivable admission into the dwelling of the hermit, proceeds to make good an entrance by force. Here, it will be remembered, the words of the narrative run thus, and Ethelred, who was by nature of a doughty heart, and who was now mighty withal, on account of the powerfulness of the wine which he had drunken, waited no longer to hold parley with the hermit, who in sooth was of an obstinate and maliciful turn, but, filling upon the rein upon his shoulder, and fearing the rising of the tempest, uplifted his mace outright and, with blows, made quickly room of the planking of the door for his gauntleted hand, and now pulling therewith sturdily. So he cracked and ripped and tore all asunder, that the noise of the dry and hollow-sounding wood alarmed and reverberated throughout the forest. At the termination of this sentence, I started, and for a moment paused, for it appeared to me, although I at once concluded that my excited fancy had deceived me, it appeared to me that, for some very remote, remote portion of the mansion, there came indistinctly to my ears what might have been, in its exact similarity of character, the echo, but a stifled and dull one, certainly, of the very cracking and ripping sound which Sir Lancelot had so particularly described. It was, beyond doubt, the coincidence alone which had arrested my attention, for, amid the rattling of the sashes of the casement, and the ordinarily commingled noises of the still increasing storm, the sound in itself had nothing, surely, which should have interested or disturbed me. I continued the story. But the good champion, Ethelred, now entering within the door, was sore, enraged, and amazed to perceive no signal of the maliceful hermit. But, in the stead thereof, a dragon of a skelly and prodigious demeanor, and of a fiery tongue, which sate in guard before a palace of gold with a floor of silver and upon the wall there hung a shield of shining brass with this legend written who entereth herein a conqueror hath been who slayeth the dragon the shield he shall win 
and Ethelred uplifted his mace and struck upon the head of the dragon, which fell before him, and gave up his pasty breath. With a shriek of horror, so horrid and harsh, and withal so piercing that Ethelred had feigned too close his ears with his hands against the dreadful noise of it, the like whereof was never heard before. Here again I paused abruptly, and now a feeling of wild amazement, for there could be no doubt whatever that, in this instance, I did actually hear, although from what direction it proceeded I found it impossible to say. A low and apparently distant but harsh, protracted, and most unusual screaming or grating sound, the exact counterpart for what my fancy had already conjured up for the dragon's unnatural shriek as described by the romancer. Oppressed as I certainly was upon the occurrence of the second and most extraordinary coincidence, by a thousand conflicting sensations in which wonder and extreme terror were predominant, I still retained sufficient presence of mind to avoid exciting, but any observation, this, the sensitive nervousness of my companion. I was by no means certain that he had noticed the sounds in question, although, assuredly, a strange alteration had, during the last few minutes, taken place in his demeanor. From a position fronting my own, he had gradually brought around his chair, so as to sit with his face to the door of the chamber, and thus I could but partially perceive his features. Although I saw that his lips trembled as if he were murmuring inaudibly, his head had dropped upon his breast. Yet I knew that he was not asleep from the wide and rigid opening of his eyes as I caught a glimpse of it in profile. The motion of his body, too, was at variance with this idea, for he rocked from side to side with a gentle yet constant and uniform sway. Having rapidly taken notice of all this, I assumed the narrative of Sir Lancelot, which thus proceeded. And now the champion, having escaped from the terrible fury of the dragon, bethinking himself of the brazen shield and of the breaking up of the enchantment which was upon it, removed the carcass from out of the way before him and approached blasphemously over the silver pavement of the castle to where the shield was upon the wall, which in sooth tarried not for his full coming but fell down at his feet upon the silver floor with a mighty and great and terrible ringing sound. No sooner had these syllables passed my lips than, as if a shield of brass had indeed at that moment fallen heavily upon a floor of silver, I became aware of a distant, hollow, metallic, and clangorous yet apparently muffled reverberation. Completely unnerved, I leaped to my feet, but the measured rocking movement of Usher was undisturbed. I rushed to the chair in which he sat. His eyes were bent fixed before me, and throughout this whole countenance there reigned a stony rigidity. But as I placed my hand upon his shoulder, there came a strong shudder over his whole person. A sickly smile quavered about his lips, and I saw that he spoke in a low, hurried, and gibbering murmur, as if unconscious of my presence, bending closely over him, I at length drank in the hideous import of his words. Not hear it? Yes, I hear it and have heard it long, long, long. Many minutes, many hours, many days have I heard it, yet I dared not. Oh, pity me, miserable wretch that I am. I dared not, I dared not speak. We have put her living in the tombs. Shall I not that my senses were acute? I now tell you that I felt her first feeble movements in the hollow coffin. I heard them many, many days ago, yet I dared not, I dared not speak. And now, tonight, Ethelred, ha, ha, the breaking of the hermit's door, and the dry cry of the dragon, and the clangoring of the shields, say, rather, the rendering of her coffin than the grating of the iron hinges of her prison and her struggles within the coppered archway of the vault. Oh, whether shall I fly? Will she not be here anon? Is she not hurrying to upbraid me for my haste? Have I not heard her footsteps on the stair? Do I not distinguish that heavy and horrible beating of her heart? Madman! Here he sprang furiously to his feet and shrieked, out his syllables, 
as if in the effort he were giving up his soul. Madman, I tell you that she now stands without the door. As if in the superhuman energy of his utterance, there had been found the potency of a spell. The huge antique panel to which the speaker pointed threw slowly back upon the instant their ponderous and ebony jaws. It was the work of the gushing, rushing gust. But then, without those doors, there did stand the lofty and enshrouded figure of the Lady Madeline of Usher. There was blood upon her white robes and the evidence of some bitter struggle upon every portion of her emaciated frame. For a moment, she remained trembling and reeling to and fro upon the threshold, then, with a low moaning cry, fell heavily inward upon the person of her brother, and in her violent and now final death agonies, bore him to the floor a corpse and a victim to the terrors he had anticipated. From that chamber and from that mansion I fled aghast. The storm was still abroad in all its wraths as I found myself crossing the old causeway, Suddenly there shot along the path a wild light, and I turned to see whence a gleam so unusual could have issued. For the vast house and its shadows were alone behind me. The radiance was that of the full, setting, and blood-red moon, which now shone vividly through the once barely discernible fissure of which I have before spoken, as extending from the roof of the building in a zigzag direction up to the base. While I gazed, this fissure rapidly widened. There came a fierce breath of the whirlwind. The entire orb of the satellite burst at once upon my sight. My brain reeled as I saw the mighty walls rushing asunder. There was a long, tumultuous shouting sound like the voice of a thousand waters, and the deep and dank tarn at my feet closed suddenly and silently over the fragments of the house of Usher. And this concludes our story. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Also, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest.